we'll be talking about tipping points in the climate system uh, today. So uh, tipping points in our diagram, they don't really follow one particular uh, one of these modules. They're kind of sitting outside in between our influence of temperature and the downstream impacts of temperature. So I just put them here in between these two uh, modules because it's really, it's kind of how temperature impacts uh, things that are downstream uh, from temperature. So first of all, um, what are why are we talking about tipping points in the climate system? So there's a couple of major motivations uh, for doing this. So motivation number one would just be that they're potentially very impactful. So we'll talk more about what these actual tipping points are and you'll see how impactful they could be for um, the influence of greenhouse gases on various things that we care about. But also they've really uh, penetrated into the forefront of the contemporary discussion on global warming. And so we can see that, for example, with uh, statements from uh, Greta Thunberg, who's probably now the most prominent um, climate change activist or climate action activist. Uh, so she gave, gave this famous speech uh, to, the, to the United Nations. And in it, she, she definitely talks about themes from uh, related to tipping points. So she says the popular idea of cutting our emissions in, ha in half in 10 years only gives us a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees. So she's kind of saying there's a threshold there. Um, and the risk of setting off irreversible chain reactions beyond human control. Uh, so that's a, that's a theme that's part of tipping points. 50% uh, may be acceptable to you, but those numbers do not include tipping points, most feedback loops, additional warming hidden by toxin, toxic air pollution, uh, or aspects of equity and climate justice. So the idea of tipping points is now kind of at the forefront of communication uh, on climate change. So stepping back, like what, what actually are tipping points? Um, so first of all, it's interesting to look at like where the term actually came from. So it originated in industry in the 1800s and kind of ironically actually it was first used in relation to uh, coal cars or coal carts. So when you would mine coal you put it in these carts that then when you want to get rid of your coal you tip over the cart and so the tipping point of course is the point at which the bucket uh, tips over. And so you can think of like, you know, when you're right at that point, all you need to do is give it just a little bit of a nudge and then you tip over into a new state. Um, and then we also have this <clears throat> idea of tipping uh, tip buckets in uh, various industrial uses. And, and one way that this is used is in rain gauges. So in the Department of Meteorology, we have, we have a bunch of these lying around. The, these are uh, tip bucket rain gauges. And this is how we measure how much it, it rains. Usually these are about a hundredth of an inch of rain. So as the rain comes in, it fills up a bucket, it tips over, that activates a magnet. Um, and then it's just gonna count, okay, that was one one hundredth of an inch, next time it tips over, another one hundredth of an inch, et cetera. And so that, again, it's, it's this idea of like nothing is changing and then all of a sudden you get this big, this big shift, this big change. So the term tipping point, although it originated uh, back in the 1800s, um, really went kind of full force into popular, popular culture, popular vernacular, uh, after this book, The Tipping Point, came out in the year 2000. So this, this is a book by Malcolm Gladwell, who's one of the most successful nonfiction authors of the 20th and 21st century. And so a lot of his books have had a lot of very wide uh, social influence. And so this book really helps the idea of tipping points um, come into the forefront of uh, kind of the public's mind. And in this book, he looks a lot at uh, kind of social phenomena like fashion, for example. So one of, one of the main uh, examples that he uses is to, to define what a tipping point is, 
is the sudden increase in the popularity of a particular shoe brand in 1995. So he was looking at the shoe brand Hush Puppies and why they surged in popularity all of a sudden in 1995. And then another uh, phenomenon that he looks, looks at is the sudden decline in New York City crime uh, in the 1990s. So obviously since this book was written in 2000, he's looking at kind of recent examples of abrupt shifts. So this was, um, this, this is a graph of number of murders in New York City by year. It was relatively low in the 50s and then it climbed up in the 60s and 70s. And then we had this dramatic uh, decline in the 1990s and then decline uh, since then as well. So the tipping points that Gladwell talks about can be kind of described by this term social contagion. Um, and so this is, this is what he says about, about kind of the thesis of this book is the tipping point is the biography of an idea. And the idea is very simple. It is the best way to understand the emergence of fashion trends, the ebb and flow of crime waves, or for that matter, the transformation of unknown books into bestsellers, or the rise of teenage smoking, or the phenomena of word of mouth, or any number of other mysterious changes that mark everyday life, is to think of them as epidemics. So obviously very topical to what's going on in the world right now. Um, Think of them as epidemics, ideas and products and messages and behaviors that spread like viruses do. So it's this idea that one person, you know, has some notion or has some idea or is displaying some fashion trend or some behavior, and then someone else copies them. And then that just spreads throughout, you know, some population. And he uses, so he uses three characteristics to define tipping points. Uh, so he talks about contagiousness, so from one person to the next. Um, and then the fact that little causes can have big effects and that changes happen not gradually, but in one dramatic moment. And so this is, I will, I will use this as kind of the public understanding of what tipping points are and then compare that to climate tipping points, which turn out to be um, a little bit different. So just summarizing that in different words, uh, tipping points exhibit rapid shifts between multiple states. So for example, a state in which an infection or a behavior is rare to a state in which it's widespread, that it's not just gradual, it's all of a sudden you're switching into a new state. Um, and then, yeah, the scale and the speed of the shifts um, how how large they are they result from some type of a positive feedback some type some type of a reinforcing mechanism uh, and so in the case of of humans that often gets called network effects right like the social network um, so that you can kind of have dominoes tipping through a network of of people and something going from being very small to very widespread in a short amount of time and so one kind of technical definition of that is that the abundance of a contagious element increases the rate at which it spreads, which further increases its abundance. So that's kind of the idea of this exponential growth that we talked about when we were um, talking about uh, the virus and climate change and just how quickly exponential growth you know, how powerful exponential growth is and how quickly these numbers get out of hand. Um, so, you know, we, we were talking about viruses before, but now we're kind of more talking about viral ideas spreading. And it, this is just this quick, you know, illustration of how powerful uh, doubling, doublings are in terms of how many numbers or how big your numbers get, how quickly. Uh, so this is, if one person gives an idea or a virus, to two people, then you're at two. After one iteration, then you're at four, then you're at eight, 16, 32. By 64, you're already off this chart. And then you can see by, you know, by 20, by 19 iterations, you're at over uh, 500,000. At 20, you're at a million. At 30, you're over a billion. And at 33 iterations of, of these doublings, you're over the population of the planet. So 
it doesn't take much if something is spreading virally for it to be very, very widespread very quickly. And so it's interesting that this book, The Tipping Point, was written before a lot of um, a lot of what we now consider the internet even existed, right? So the internet is dominated by things that have tipped. And this book was written in 2000, so that's before Facebook, before Twitter, before um, YouTube. There was MySpace, I suppose. So that would be one way for uh, ideas to go viral. But so then th this book, if it was rewritten today, would probably have a lot of internet themes on it. So you would talk about like viral videos. Um, so like Gangnam Style is, is an example of a video that um, certainly was viral in terms of it didn't, it wasn't like imposed from the top down uh, on people. Hey, everybody watch this video. It was passed from person to person. And you can see that uh, it has over 3 billion views, 3.5 billion views on YouTube. So um, approaching half the population of the planet. Uh, you know, obviously not everyone watches at one time, but just compared to the population of the planet, it's it's half the size. So that's huge. And um, the the most viewed video on YouTube I just looked was is Despacito, which has more than the population of the planet. So it's like nine billion views. So that's uh, pretty incredible for some some you know component of culture to spread that wide. Um, and so we see this, you know, not just with things like viral videos, but with apps. So TikTok has been blowing up uh, recently. And then, you know, we see this, like, how much it can then affect the real world that uh, apps like Lyft and Uber, you know, at first have very little penetration, very few people are using them, and then all of a sudden they tip and then everyone's using them. And then all of a sudden taxi cabs are out of business and then airports look different and you're supposed to go to these uh, rideshare locations. Um, and so that's that's definitely something that's that's tipped uh, because of the internet. And then things, you know, on, on Twitter, memes, hashtags, Twitter is designed to have things go viral and to have things tip, right? So this retweet button is literally that in action where someone says something and then if someone else retweets it it shows up on their all of their followers timelines as if that person had tweeted it and so people with large influences on twitter it's it's like changing this base number instead of doubling like you could have this be like a hundred right so if you have if you have a hundred followers and all a hundred followers retweet your tweet and all of them have 100 followers, then it's instead of it passing it to two people, it's 100 each time. And so then that would be, uh, or 100 raised to the power of whatever iteration you're on. And so that would be even that much more powerful. And that's how we've seen ideas like, um, you know, like Me Too and Black Lives Matter. These, these were hashtags that started off with just a very few number of people and then went viral through this kind of retweeting uh, exercise and then all of a sudden everyone knows what those phrases mean and so those are those are ideas or memes uh, that tipped so now I want to compare this kind of general notion of tipping points um, which I think is exemplified by these Malcolm Gladwell type tipping points uh, to the climate tipping points that we're going to be talking about today so the tipping point book version of tipping points in the climate system is this paper, this 2009 paper by Timothy Lenton and others. Um, and so this really laid out the, the groundwork or the framework for how to think about tipping points uh, in the climate system. And so these tipping points, interestingly, have some fundamental differences with what I'll call Gladwellian social tipping points. Um, so just kind of first to, to look at what their definitions are. First, instead of defining a tipping point, they first defined a tipping element, which is just some component of the climate system. And they have this spatial part of the definition. It has to be subcontinental or larger meaning like, you know, the size of India, for example. Um, so it has to be sub subcontinental or larger. 
And it's an element in which you can get these threshold responses or something where um, a little cause has a big effect. So that's, that's a definition, that's a component of the definition that's uh, similar to the Gladwell tipping points. Um, and then the tipping point is the th critical threshold at which the small change in forcing like a change in temperature would trigger the disproportionate response, like for example, uh, ice melting. And under this definition, um, this is one of the major differences, is that crossing a threshold in the climate system commits us to a change in the long term, um, but it doesn't necessarily happen all at once. So it could take centuries or even millennia to be realized. So you're, the tipping point is crossing the threshold and then maybe you've committed to something very, very far into the future as far as human time skills are concerned. And then the change might also be irreversible. So irreversible is another um, part of this definition, or at least it can be. So the change, it's, that's kind of like a, an amendum, is that the change also may be irreversible, but it doesn't have to be. So if we look at these definitions or these um, descriptions of tipping points in the climate system compared to the Gladwell ones, basically they, they don't, talk anything about contagiousness, right? So there's not, you're not spreading through a, a social network or anything like that. So that's out of the definition. And then it's not the case that they gradual or that they happen all at once in some, tr some dramatic moment, at least on human time scales, maybe on geologic time scales, these could be considered uh, abrupt. And so it's really just this, this single element that they, that they share in common. Little causes have big effects. And so we'll um, focus on that component when we talk about these tipping elements in the climate system. Um, one other thing about this paper that is important to note is that these tipping points in the climate system are very speculative. So they're not, um, they're not like well-defined points that science, you know, quote unquote, knows exactly where they are and that we are, you know, ready to say, okay, you know, we're this far away from this point and we know exactly when it's going to happen. And then once it does, this is what's going to happen. Um, it's really much more speculative and cloudy than that. And so this is kind of exemplified by this uh, passage in this uh, paper. That it says, many of the systems we consider do not yet have convincingly established tipping points. Nevertheless, increasing political demand to define and justify binding temperature targets, as well as wider social interest in nonlinear climate changes, makes it timely to review potential tipping elements in the climate system under anthropogenic forcing. So they're basically saying that, you know, there's calls to keep global warming under certain thresholds. And so because of these calls, it's a worthwhile exercise to kind of brainstorm about where there might be tipping elements in the climate system. So it's a little bit different than thinking about it like science has established tipping point X, Y, Z. It's more, this is just the reality is that we really don't know about a lot of these. And so these are kind of just brainstorming exercises. And so going along with that, it's important to note that the Paris Agreement targets of keeping global temperature below two degrees above pre-industrial values or below two degrees total of global warming and or below 1.5 degrees total of global warming, these targets are international goals, but they're not well-defined tipping points in the climate system. And so that was a major point of confusion when this um, IPCC report came out in 2018, which was, this was a report on the impacts of global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're currently at about one. So with an additional 0.5 degrees Celsius, what are the impacts? That was what this report was about. And a lot of the media coverage was something along these lines. So this is a headline from the New York Times. It says a new climate tipping point. And they're basically, they're covering this report coming out and they're acting like 
1.5 degrees Celsius is some tipping point in which you switch into some new state. And that's really not the case. Um, so this report was just about the impacts that you get at 1.5, not that you switch into some new state at 1.5. And actually when uh, scientists have looked at this in detail, looked at the climate models and looked for various uh, points at which you might tip into a new state, uh, they don't find any global temperature at which that happens. So this is just an example of a paper that, that looked at something like, like that. It says, um, well, the title of the paper is Catalog of Abrupt Shifts in Climate Models, essentially. And they say, we find no compelling evidence for a general relationship between the overall number of abrupt shifts and the level, level of global warming. So we know, and we'll talk about today, that there are various elements in the climate system that might tip at various levels of warming, but there's not some one global temperature at which we expect everything to spiral out of control or something like that. And that's all this is saying. So yeah, not, not one single established level of global warming that can be considered a tipping point. Um, but having said that, we do know for sure that there are components of the climate system that act very non-linearly and very, um, very much like this threshold response where you push it, push it, push it, it doesn't do anything. And then all of a sudden it changes uh, very dramatically, kind of the straw that broke the camel's back type of thing. And so one example of that, um, I'll just show, you don't need to know the details of this, it's just establishing that we know that these things exist. Uh, so one example of this is called a, a Heinrich event or a Dansgaard Oeschger event. And what this graph is showing is essentially how warm it is at the top of the Greenland ice sheet. And this is going back 80,000 years before the present, 60,000 years before the present, 40,000 years before the present, 20,000 years before the present, and then present day. And so this is our relatively stable Holocene climate period. And then as you go back in time, you see these dramatic spikes and they're numbered in this graph. And so one thing we know, these are very large temperature changes at the, at the top of Greenland. And one thing we know is that there's not some external forcing that like really explains these temperature changes. So we know that this is somehow a redistribution of heat in the climate system that's being, um, that's, that must be relying on positive feedbacks or some, uh, some mechanism where you have a threshold response where you don't have a proportionate response to your uh, forcing. So we know that this is some type of like a tip, tippy like element of the climate system. And so this is just to say that we know these things do exist in the climate system. And it's, it's clear in the geological record that we have things that, that are nonlinear and thresholdy and, and tippy. Okay, so this irreversible component is uh, worthwhile to talk about a little bit more. So I'm gonna compare um, two different notions of the response of something um, to an amount of global warming. One where you have a threshold, but the threshold is reversible. And then one where you have a threshold, but the threshold is less reversible or perhaps irreversible on human time scales is another way um, that gets put. So a graph that would have a threshold that's reversible would look something like this. Um, and I'll just first I'll compare it to the graph that uh, is less reversible. So you have this similar aspect except now you have this this cycle in here. So let's show you what, what this would mean. So like, let's say you're starting down here at, you have one degree of global warming, and then on the y-axis is something that you care about. Like, let's say it's, I guess, okay, if we're warming and it's going up, like let's say it's the amount of thawed ground in the Arctic. So you have permafrost, but the amount of thawed ground is gonna go up as you're warming. So let's say you're warm, you have global warming, and so you're, you're increasing your amount of thawed ground in the Arctic by a little bit, and then you have a little bit more warming, 
And then all of a sudden you have some, you've initiated some type of a self-sustaining positive feedback. And now you don't have to warm the globe anymore, but then you get this big change in the amount of thawed ground. So all of a sudden now you have way more thawed ground, even though you didn't change your amount of global warming. So you cross some threshold, you have some straw that broke the camel's back. And then as you increase uh, temperatures more, you are thawing a little bit more ground, but it's not nearly as dramatic. And so then this is the important part is that if you go back, if you start cooling the temperatures again, in this case, you can cross the threshold on the other side and go back. So you, um, once you start cooling, then all of a sudden you're initiating your positive feedback in the other direction. And so then you are freezing a bunch of ground. And so you have a, you have a threshold but it's reversible, right? And like, so that like a clear example of something that would not be like that is like if you kill an ecosystem or something, right? It's like you warm up, you warm up, you warm up. Um, a coral reef would be a good example of this. You kill the coral reef, it dies off. Now, if you cool down, does a coral reef spontaneously come back to life? Like, no, it's dead, it's gone. So that's irreversible. Um, but some things do have thresholds that are reversible. And then here would be an example of a kind of less reversible, is that you warm up, your response to something is um, changing, it's going up, you cross some threshold, and so then you get this big change in your response. And then if you start cooling, or you, yeah, so you warm more, and then if you start cooling, you actually don't cross this threshold in the other direction, at least at the same temperature. And then you're kind of stuck up in this other, uh, this other phase of the system. This is called a bifurcation. Um, but the phrase that, the vocabulary word that we'll use in this class is hysteresis. So hysteresis is the dependence of the state of the system on its history. And what that would mean in this case is that depending on where you are, in this cycle, um, you're going to have different you're going to have different values for your response of something. Um, so if you're at two degrees of global warming, uh, and you want to know where where am I on my y-axis, where am I on my response, that will depend on this on the system's history, whether or not you're coming up uh, down here on this trajectory, or whether or not you're coming back down here on this trajectory. And I'll show another example of that, which is clearer. But yeah, so in this case, it would be like, you'd have to cool much more and then you cross a different threshold to get back down here. And then you could start over uh, on this component of your cycle. So let's do the same thing. Look at the same idea of hysteresis, but with an actual uh, physical example, um, something that we're familiar with. So let's look at uh, the relationship between the amount of energy coming in from the sun. And I've just put this in here in arbitrary units. So it goes from 0 0.85 to 1.1. And then look at the relationship between that, the energy coming in from the sun, and global uh, temperature. So we're going to start off down here where we have relatively low energy coming in from the sun at low global temperature. And then let's say we start warming up um, the climate by increasing the sun, the output from the sun. So the sun gets a little bit brighter. It goes from 0.85 to 0.9 units. So then the temperature is gradually increasing. And then we keep doing this. We get, so the energy coming from the sun now is at one unit. So a little bit more, the temperature is gradually increasing. Then we get to 1.1 units, we're turning up the sun even more, the temperature is gradually increasing as we're melting ice. But let's say now at 1.1, we've reached a point where the ice sheets melt becomes kind of self-sustaining, right? So we talked about the ice albedo feedback where as ice melts, that means there's less reflective area reflecting sunlight back to space. And so then more of that sun's energy is absorbed at the surface, which warms the temperature, which can melt the ice more. And so that means that at this point, you've reached 
you've reached a point where you don't even have to turn up the sun anymore. And now the global temperature dramatically increases because the ice sheet is just by itself melting away. And so then your global temperature spikes up without any change in the sun. And so then if you turn down the sun, back down to one unit, the sun is getting dimmer, but it's too hot for the ice sheet to form. The ice sheet is not gonna form because you're stuck up here with the temperature being too warm. And so this is essentially an irreversible change then. You melted away the ice sheet, now you're stuck in a, in a temperature that's too warm to get the ice sheet to come back, even if you um, take, even if you turn back down the sun to this level of one in this case. And so this is hysteresis. So this means that, um, you know, the state of the system at any given time depends on its history. So global temperature in this case depends not only on the energy coming from the sun, but also on whether there's an ice sheet there or not. And whether there's, a, there's an ice sheet there or not depends on the long history of uh, what has happened uh, in the past. And so this is, this is interesting. Like if, you've, um, if you remember from uh, algebra or pre-calculus or calculus, you study functions in, in those math classes, right? And it will, when you study a function, it will say like y equals f of x. And so what that means is that if I give you x, you can give me y. So part of the definition of a function is that every single y value, um, or every single x value gives you exactly one y value. So like y equals f of x equals x squared means every x value that you put in there will give you one y value. But these, in the real world, we see things like this all the time where the actual thing that you care about is not a function of the forcing. Um, and to like why that is, is because if I give you X, you can't necessarily give me Y without knowing something about the history of the system. So if I give you X equals one, you could say, well, Y might equal 0 0.9 or it might equal 1.075. Um, but so it's not a direct function of that. And so unfortunately functions are less applicable in the real world than they are in uh, math class. So hysteresis, the dependence of the state of a system on its history. So that was a, that was a example in climate science, but it's actually even more intuitive than that, I would say. So like uh, a good example of hysteresis just in everyday life is the popularity of various things. So for example, the popularity of sports. Um, so whether that's American football in the United States or uh, you know cricket in India, these things definitely have uh, hysteresis where they are popular because of some, you know, a bunch of historical contingencies and accidents. And then they've reached some state where they're in this like self-perpetuating uh, system, right? So it's like the sport is in the media a lot. And then there are many opportunities to play the sport. You know, so it being in the media a lot means that there's going to be a lot of opportunities to play the sport, which means that uh, there's public interest in the sport, which keeps it in the media. And so these things all kind of reinforce each other. And so like to bring that point home, like what if we, what if we were to take one of these elements out? So imagine we were to erase everyone in the United States knowledge or memory of American football overnight and then waited 50 years. And then you ask the question like, okay, would it, would it reemerge? Is it just a product of like, football being so intrinsically interesting that it would just have to come back in exactly the same form, even if everyone uh, forgot what it was. And, you know, the answer is almost certainly not, right? Like it, it is where it is because of a bunch of historical accidents and it's in this kind of self-perpetuating state, this kind of chicken egg state 
um, but it's it's dependent on its history uh, to, to for it to have gotten to that state. And so if you pull one of these elements out of its self-sustaining mechanism, it will probably uh, collapse. And so it would be an irreversible change. This would be an example of an irreversible uh, change to that system. And so, you know, other things that are popular, what about like celebrities? So this would definitely apply to um, especially certain celebrities like uh, Kim Kardashian, who I don't know what her like, job description would be, right? It's not like she's a singer or uh, actress necessarily. She kind of is in this state that she's in this self-perpetuating state where it's like the person is in the media a lot. Lots of people are exposed to this person. There's public interest in the person. And so then you, you have this situation where she's famous because she's famous, right? She has 161 million Instagram followers. And it's basically because other people follow her, right? Other like people want to know about her because other people want to know about her. And so she's in this self-sustaining state. So similarly, if we were to pull one of these elements out, so remove the public interest in the person and were to wait five years, would Kim Kardashian spontaneously reemerge just as famous as she was uh, previously? Um, <laughs> probably not. Marco says she bought followers. Uh, yeah, that, that, that would be a part of it too. Um, also she, she's married to Kanye West, so that might keep her in the limelight more than, more than someone else. But the point here is that if you were to, if you were to take out one of these elements, like immediately have it where, um, the person is not in the media all of a sudden, um, that kind of collapses the entire self-sustaining system. And so there's this happens with celebrities, right? Where it's like someone used to be very famous and then um, all of a sudden they're kind of gone. They're gone from public spotlight and it's kind of a mystery why, but it's like one of these things was, was pulled from their self-sustaining cycle. So I don't know, like I was thinking of, so I'm like 14 years older than you, so I have different people. But like to me, someone that comes to mind is, is Jessica Simpson was someone that was like as popular, as famous as she could be and then kind of just disappeared. Um, Ashton Kutcher, I remember when Twitter was like first exploding, uh, Ashton Kutcher was one of the like basically most famous celebrities that there is. And so he, there was a race between CNN, at CNN handle on Twitter, and Ashton Kutcher to see who would get a million followers first. So these were like, so Ashton Kutcher was like the most famous online celebrity. And like now I never hear about Ashton Kutcher. So something happened with his self-sustaining uh, popularity. He was pulled out of that. Um, but celebrities, maybe this isn't the perfect uh, analogy because I think they can come back. It's not quite as irreversible because there's residual memory of them in everyone's uh, mind. But if you were to actually erase the memory, then they, then they wouldn't be able to, to come back. Okay, so that's all background and tipping elements. And so now I'm going to go kind of uh, quickly through a number of tipping elements that we're most uh, concerned about in the climate system. And so as far as the uh, test is concerned, you're not going to be asked about like super specific mechanisms. This is just, I'm just kind of highlighting what are the, what are the major uh, elements in the climate system that we're concerned about tipping and some rough idea as to why we might be concerned about them tipping. So I'm going to go through uh, five of these uh, relatively quickly. So Greenland ice sheet disintegration, disintegration. So two of these are ice sheets um, melting which is not a uh, super mystery as to why, right? It's just warming and they start melting. Uh, permafrost loss is another one with ice melting. And then we have a ocean circulation change. So the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation uh, is a fancy name for an ocean circulation that might shut down or shut off, which would have um, some big consequences. And then Amazon rainforest dieback. So it's possible that the Amazon is 
essentially kind of a self-sustaining system. And it's possible that you could push that into a point where it tips over and um, basically the Amazon turns into a savanna rather than a rainforest. So first, let's go over these ice ones. So one thing about the Greenland ice sheet, if you look at the Greenland ice sheet from space, this is what it looks like. And this is with the sea ice taken away in the, in the uh, Arctic Ocean. But notice how lonely it looks. Notice what an anomaly it is, right? So it's, it's this ice sheet sitting on the continent of Greenland. Um, but you might ask, like, why is there not ice at the same latitude over here in Alaska? Why is there not ice at the same latitude in Canada? Why is there not ice um, at the same latitude in Northern Europe? And so what's that, what that is telling you is that the Greenland ice sheet probably has some self-sustaining aspect to it, right? And so it's only there because it is there, similar to uh, American football and, and Kim Kardashian. Um, so this is, this is the simplified version of the self-sustaining aspect for the Greenland ice sheet is, is basically that um, it's big enough, there's enough mass on the ice sheet for the top of the ice sheet to be high enough in the atmosphere such that it's cold enough for everything to fall as snow. So we talked about, you know, as, as uh, you go up in the atmosphere, it's colder. And if your ice sheet is high enough, then that means all the precipitation falls as snow because it's cold. Um, so even, even here where um, we're at an elevation where temperature is above freezing, a lot of our precipitation starts off as snow in the upper atmosphere and then it, it melts as it, as it comes down through the atmosphere. But if you have an ice sheet that's really tall, then it's not going to have time to melt. And so it's going to fall as snow. So that would mean that part of this self-sustaining mechanism is that uh, the ice sheet is tall enough, so the precipitation falls as snow. And that means that um, there's enough frozen water, enough mass being accumulated at the center of the ice sheet to balance all of the melting that happens um, on the outskirts. And so if you were to pull one of these components out, if you were to say, okay, it's going to get warm enough so that the top of the ice sheet is now low enough in elevation where not all your precipitation is going to fall as snow anymore and some of it's going to fall as rain, then you might initiate kind of this self-reinforcing feedback. Um, yeah, so as it warms, then the elevation of the ice sheet decreases. And so then it's going to warm more and melt more. And we talked about this may basically already be happening because we've been looking at uh, ice mass loss from Greenland. And we talked about how it's down over 4,000 gigatons of ice just since we've been able to measure this with gravity satellites since 2002, where to remind you, this is what a gigaton uh, sized ice cube looks like compared to the Empire State Building. So losing a ton of mass. Um, and yeah, so this, this means that we may have already essentially tipped this um, system into a new state. Like it's definitely on a trajectory where if we were to stop global warming today, it's not gonna get any warmer. That does not mean that the ice sheet is gonna stop melting. So it's gonna be continuing to melt. Um, but then that brings up the question of, of like how long it takes for it to melt. And so that's part of this important difference between the Malcolm Gladwell type uh, tipping points that are all about things happening very quickly in one abrupt moment uh, versus climate, tipping points where the crossing, the crossing of a threshold commits us to a change, but the change itself may take centuries or longer to be realized. So just look at how long it would actually take to melt Greenland. So this is a graph of Greenland melt in terms of how much sea level rise Greenland would contribute, so global sea level rise. This is in meters, so to just to remind you, a meter is 3.28 uh, 
feet. And so look at the time scale here. This is the year 3000, the year 2800, the year 2600, the year 2400, 2200. So we often talk about the year 2100 in climate change pro projections. But if you're talking about melting Greenland, you have to go out, uh, you know, a thousand years. Um, so these are various uh, emission scenarios that we've talked about. So RCP 8.5 is our high emission scenario. RCP 4.5 is our medium. And then RCP 2.6 is kind of like a meeting the Paris goals uh, emission scenario. But they don't really, they're almost stacked up on top of each other by 2100. You don't really see the spread emerge um, until well into this millennium. So, you know, 2500 is when they're really starting to emerge. And yeah, so this is, this is what Greenland looks like in the year 3000 under high emissions, um, under medium emissions, <clears throat> and under Paris Agreement uh, type emissions. So we absolutely may be on the path to totally melting Greenland and increasing sea level by eight meters. So in the 20s of feet just from Greenland alone. So that doesn't include sea level rise from thermal expansion or sea level rise from Antarctica. Um, but we're not going to be seeing it in the next, you know, several decades. And even by 2100, it's not super obvious. Uh, it takes a long time to melt these things. So, you know, Greenland has been there for hundreds of millions of years, or the uh, ice sheet has been there for hundreds of millions of years. And so they don't disappear uh, in decades. So for each one of these tipping elements, I'll put them on our uh, projection of global temperature. Uh, so our various uh, fanning projections with different emission scenarios. So I'll, I'll show you where we might hit these thresholds and how long they might take. So I showed you this before. This is you know, our pre-industrial temperature, global warming, where we are right now in, in 2020. Here's our two Paris goals. This is where we think current policies, if they were to be implemented as stated on the books, would bring us to in 2100. Um, and so this is, this is the Greenland ice sheet disintegration tipping point plotted on top of that. So basically, we think that we may have already crossed the tipping point. We're not really sure. Um, and so it could be anywhere from one degree Celsius above pre-industrial where we are right now to three degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. Um, so two additional degrees. degrees. Um, but then the horizontal axis is how long it takes to actually transition. And so that's like centuries uh, to millennia. So it's kind of good news, bad news, definitely bad news that we may have already tipped that. Um, we're not really sure. Uh, you know, and I say we're not sure because if we were to stop emissions today, this previous projection kind of showed that you wouldn't, you would maintain much of the ice sheet uh, by the year 3000. But that's an uncertain projection as well. We're not really sure how strong these self-reinforcing feedbacks are. Uh, so the tipping point could be higher, it could be at two or three degrees. Um, but then the, so that's the bad news, but then the good news is that at least um, you have centuries to millennia to deal with it. So whether or not you're thinking about dealing with it by moving people away from coasts, building seawalls, that would be adaptation, or if we figure out uh, how to scale technology to pull carbon out of the atmosphere, then you could uh, potentially stop the, the melting of the ice sheet by bringing temperature, global temperatures back down. So, that's the Greenland ice sheet disintegration. So the West Antarctic ice sheet disintegration is, is very similar um, in concept. So one important thing about the West Antarctic ice sheet is that it's actually the bedrock that it lies on is underwater. So I'll show you what happens. So basically over millions of years, you have snow building up over the continent. So in this case, the continent of Antarctica, that snow is turns into ice over the long term. Um, you know, so an ice sheet builds up because it snows in the winter and then it's cold enough for the snow to survive the summer so that when the snow, when it snows again the next winter, it just piles up on top of the previous winter's snow. 
And over millions of years, you can get an ice sheet that's over a mile, multiple miles uh, in height or in depth. And so that's what happened so much so in Antarctica that the ice sheet is so big that it actually depresses the uh, continent. So the continent is now under sea level and it's kind of like the ice is acting like um, the continent. And so that means that it's very precarious because for sure that ice sheet would not be there if it was just an ocean. It needed that land to be above sea level in order for the ice sheet to build up. And so then if it starts melting, um, essentially what happens is this, uh, well, for, okay, so first this is, this is a graph or this is a map of uh, the elevation of Antarctica underneath the ice sheet. So a lot of these glaciers, a lot of this, what you see uh, from space is sitting on bedrock that is now below sea level. And so the, that means that the ice sheet, like Kim Kardashian, is only there because it's there. It's this self-perpetuating uh, system. And if you were to delete it, if you were to pull out one of these elements, like the ice sheet not being tall enough so that precipitation falls as snow, um, then the, the ice sheet will kind of, you know, go into the state of self-reinforcing uh, feedbacks and melt itself and be irreversible on human time scales that so you wouldn't get it back by all of a sudden cooling temperatures to where they are now. Um, this is the technical mechanism for what happens uh, to the West Antarctic ice sheet is called marine ice sheet instability. Um, and so that's basically this idea that as it starts to melt more of the ice sheet um, this grounding line, it's called, uh, is exposed to water that's below, that's above the freezing point of uh, water. So as it, as it melts, and since this, uh, this continent slopes backward, it's called a retrograde slope. It's sloping backward into the center of Antarctica. As it melts, then more and more of the ice sheet is exposed to this water that's gonna melt it more and more. And so that's just gonna initiate this positive feedback loop. Um, and so that's another major concern is that we may have warmed up the temperature enough to initiate that positive feedback. And as we talked about a few lectures ago, again, with our satellite measurements of Antarctica, we see huge mass loss in this location, in this West Antarctic uh, location. So down uh, 2,000 gigatons, or this is a gigaton um, ice cube, down 2,000 gigatons on Antarctica overall. And most of that is concentrated in this, what's called the West Antarctic region, which is sitting on bedrock that's below sea level. And so very precarious, very uh, potentially sensitive. Um, so the same thing kind of applies here in terms of the time scales. It may be centuries rather than millennia that you would melt that. And, you know, the bad news is, again, we may have already crossed some threshold where uh, that is essentially destined to melt in the long term. Um, but it's possible that that threshold is not until closer to four degrees uh, Celsius. So a lot of uncertainty with, with these. Okay, Amazon rainforest dieback. Uh, this is another uh, potentially scary one. So first, uh, this is where the Amazon rainforest is. So most of the Amazon rainforest is in Brazil and then distributed amongst uh, several other countries, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia. Uh, the important thing about the rainforest is the rain part in terms of the uh, climate system uh, tippiness of the rainforest. So rainforests require rain. And interestingly, rainforests produce rain. And so you can kind of start to get a feel for, okay, how, how might this be a self-perpetuating uh, system? 
So just to put some more to, to, to flesh that out a little bit, right? Rainforests require rain because of our, think about our photosynthesis equation, right? So all plants, they require carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they require water from the environment, they require sun, they use that to make uh, glucose stored in their plant tissue and they release oxygen. So they need water. Okay, where do they get that water from? So the initial input is gonna be, you have evaporation over the ocean, right? So you have the Atlantic Ocean next to, uh, next to Brazil, next to, the, next to the rainforest. That water vapor makes it over land, over South America, where you have condensation and precipitation. So that's your, that's your input. Um, and then we talked last, we talked on Monday a little bit about evapotranspiration. So some of that water just sits on the ground and evaporates back into the atmosphere. A lot of it is transpired from the plants themselves, where the plants are, you know, taking the water in from their roots and then it's going up their stems through uh, osmosis. And then the plants release the water to the atmosphere. They actually, they don't use most of it in photosynthesis. They just release it back uh, to the atmosphere. And so that means that you're going to have a bunch more water vapor in the atmosphere than you would have otherwise because that rainforest is actually there. And it turns out that 50%, so half of the rainfall in the Amazon is recycled or regenerated um, rain that came through the plants themselves and was recycled back into the atmosphere. So much of the rain is only there because the rainforest is there itself. And so that means, again, we have this self-perpetuating system. The rainforest produces a great amount of evapotranspiration. The atmosphere produces a great amount of rain. These things reinforce each other. And so then the rainforest is essentially there uh, because it's there. And so we can actually, here's an example where we can actually see this uh, from space. So this is a picture of the Amazon from space. And so this would be, you know, your source of water is coming from the ocean, is coming over here. But most of these clouds, most of this water vapor is made possible by the plants themselves bringing, putting the water uh, back into the atmosphere where it's condensing and then raining and then reinforcing um, the rainforest system. So what could perturb this? What could happen? Um, so it's possible that climate change will reduce the initial rainfall in the Amazon. So that would be a situation like this. So we, uh, we talked about this map last time. This is the change in rainfall everywhere uh, under a high emissions scenario in the year 2100. And we see that over the Amazon, the there's not a strong signal, but the kind of middle of the road guess is that we would have a decrease in precipitation uh, in the Amazon. And so that would mean essentially that we are reducing the amount of rain coming in uh, to the system from the outside. And so then that could kind of cascade. If you have less precipitation initially, then you're going to have less evapotranspiration. And especially inland, as, as the rainforest typically kind of uh, advex all that moisture inland, that that could start causing uh, die off of the rainforest that way. So that's one mechanism. Another mechanism is that um, increased atmospheric CO2 itself actually makes the plants um, more efficient with their water. So it means that they have to open their stomata less and they, they let out less water as they're doing their photosynthesis. And so that could actually decrease uh, evapotranspiration or could decrease transpiration. And so that would mean that you have less, um, less evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration and so that could harm this self-perpetuating cycle as well. Again, I'm not going to ask you about like the, the details of these mechanisms. It's more the concept that you have something that's a self-perpetuating system and that there's something about climate change that's going to pull out one of those self-perpetuating mechanisms and so then can cause the entire thing uh, to collapse. And then the third thing that could harm the Amazon rainforest is not really through climate change, it's through deforestation. So 
obviously if you just cut down a bunch of the rainforest and like I think 17% of the Amazon is deforested uh, today relative to where it was previously, that makes the whole thing weaker because you're going to start reducing evapotranspiration that way and you're going to potentially cause positive feedbacks. You're going to potentially cause the uh, entire thing to collapse. And so the more deforestation you have, the less warming you would have to have in order to tip the entire system uh, into a new state. So the modeling on this shows that Amazon dieback could occur uh, as early as about three degrees of global warming above uh, pre-industrial levels, um, and it could be as high as five degrees. And then this is a little bit of a quicker one, especially compared to the ice sheets, that it could transition. It wouldn't just necessarily be, you know, a desert or a barren landscape. It would transition from a rainforest into a savanna type ecosystem. Um, but obviously that would be incredibly detrimental to all of the biodiversity and uh, life that is currently uh, in the rainforest. Um, so let's do just this one, or let's do, we have two more here. So one is this um, ocean circulation, the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. And this is a ocean current. I think the most famous component of it is called the Gulf Stream. So we have uh, warm water coming up from the south and then part of that forms the Gulf Stream and then part of that makes it up into the North Atlantic. That cold water then sinks and is transported back down to the south uh, at depth, so near the bottom of the ocean. So that's why this says uh, North Atlantic deep water. Deep water meaning that it's at the bottom of the ocean. And then this North Atlantic current is at the surface. And so this ocean circulation, what it does is it transports a bunch of heat northward into the North Atlantic. And the whole thing can be kind of thought of like a conveyor belt, right? And so you need this water here to sink and to go back to the south, and you need it to come back up um, at some point and then flow back to the north. And these are all connected just through conservation of mass, that you can't have one thing going without the other thing going. The whole thing has to be on or the whole thing has to be off. And so that means if you were to change one part of this, so um, we think it's mainly driven, the whole circulation is mainly driven by the fact that you have a bunch of cold water sinking in the North Atlantic. Um, so if you were to somehow make that water less dense and less able to sink, you might turn off this entire conveyor belt. Um, so here's our self-perpetuating self system. We have the import of salt, of dense salty water, colder water, or it's warmer, but then it cools down and sinks. We have this uh, import into the North Atlantic. And then that is what causes the sinking of the water. Um, and then it's all connected through this conveyor belt. And so we are worried that with global warming, um, either meltwater from the Greenland ice sheet or enhanced rain, that will cause more fresh water to be in the North Atlantic. And fresh water is less dense than salty water. And so that might make it more difficult for water to sink here. And so then it could turn off uh, the conveyor. But then another concern is that it might warm here more uh, than elsewhere. And so that differential warming um, might cause the density gradients to not be uh, sufficient to cause water to sink here and thus maintain the uh, conveyor belt. And so we do think that there is evidence that this is already happening. So if we look at uh, trends in temperature globally, I've shown this a few times, trends in temperature globally from 1800 or 1880 to 2020, um, it's warmed essentially everywhere except in this North Atlantic region. And we do think that this warming hole is because the circulation is slowing down. And so you're putting less, you're advecting less heat into the North Atlantic. And so it's slowing down, has not shut off. 
Um, but if it did shut off, this would cause a major cooling of the Northern Hemisphere. And so this was the premise of the 2004 movie, The Day After Tomorrow. Uh, in that movie, it happened in a matter of hours or something where uh, New York and, and all of Europe and everything immediately froze uh, because of global warming. And this is something that's possible. So it just wouldn't happen that fast and it wouldn't be as dramatic as this uh, picture. But this is, a, this is a map of the change in temperature that we would expect from this circulation shutting down. So we would have major cooling in most of the Northern uh, Hemisphere. And so this would presumably, this would be happening as the earth is getting warmer and warmer and warmer, and then this thing shuts down. And so then you have cooling relative to what you would have had otherwise. Uh, and then, it, so there, it's basically canceling each other out. Um, that you have global warming from greenhouse gases, then you have cooling from this shutdown in the circulation. And they're on, they're on roughly the same magnitude where you actually could return to temperatures um, previous to global warming. Um, whether or not that would be a good thing or bad thing, I don't know. I mean, this would be highly disruptive and then you, you still have the uh, Southern Hemisphere warming and there would probably be a bunch of unforeseen uh, consequences of that. But if you're primarily concerned about temperature itself uh, for whatever impact you were looking at, this actually would be something that would bring us back uh, down in terms of temperature. So it'd be kind of a negative feedback on on uh, global warming anyway. So the modeling for that tipping point puts at a, at about three to five degrees Celsius. So again, within, these are all like, you know, tipping points that we were either kind of crossing already or they're within our choices of what we're gonna be looking at for the remainder of the century, which means that they're within our choices of what we're doing right now because our, our you know, energy infrastructure lasts for 30 years. So every coal power plant that we build now, uh, especially in China and India, where they are building new coal power plants all the time, those are committing us to additional uh, amounts of warming and potentially putting us on these paths that cross us into these potential tipping points. Um, so the range here is three to five Celsius. And then we think that that would collapse on a time scale of about a century. So um, not in an afternoon like they do in the day after tomorrow, but a uh, century is still, uh, still quick on geological uh, timescales. So I will, I'm gonna summarize these in this chart. So one thing I didn't get to, um, but I'll just tell you right now, is this idea of Arctic permafrost melt. Um, so some people will, will kind of say that, oh, it's gonna get warmer and then that's gonna start melting um, frozen carbon in the Arctic and that will just amplify the warming further. And then it will just tip the entire system into a new state where you just have runaway warming. Um, when we look at that in detail and we look at the modeling of that, we really don't see that. So we, we see that as it gets warmer, um, there will be carbon released from permafrost and from methane hydrates and, and clathrates, uh, but we don't see that as a self-perpetuating, self-amplifying feedback. So it's something to be concerned about in terms of how much warming we get, but we, we're not concerned about it in terms of it being a tipping element that goes into a new state. But the rest of these, uh, Greenland ice sheet melt, West Antarctic ice sheet melt, as well as the, this ocean circulation and uh, rainforest dieback are coming up here potentially this century if we haven't already uh, crossed them. And then they do take longer than we typically think about with a tipping element, but this is still abrupt on, on geological timescales and it could have very large uh, consequences uh, for a number of things. So, you know, putting these two together uh, is 12 meters of sea level rise. So, you know, getting getting near like 30 feet of sea level rise, like even though that's over centuries to millennia, that's, you think about, you know, the, the pyramid of Gaza was, was built like 4,000 years ago. So it's weird for us to think on timescales longer than a decade, but hopefully there's gonna be people around and they won't be 
very happy with us if we totally reshape the uh, global coastlines um, from just our actions over these uh, current decades. And so one thing I put on here along with that is energy transition. So there could be a tipping point in moving from fossil fuels uh, to you know, renewable energy or uh, energy systems that don't release carbon as a byproduct. Uh, and so that would, go, that would go back to the Malcolm Gladwell type uh, tipping points where you have uh, some type of a social or political contagion where an idea takes hold and then um, we actually get uh, a transition into action on that level. So I just put that on here as, a, as perhaps maybe the most relevant tipping point that would be potentially activated in the next, um, over the next decade or two. Uh, so this was not an exhaustive list and I'll just show a map from another paper of um, other potential tipping elements. Again, going back to that original theme of the paper, these are very speculative. They're kind of cloudy and foggy as to where they might be and whether or not they might exist as actual tipping points. And a lot of these even have just, you know, question marks on them. Um, but, you know, the more we warm, the more we might get surprises and have something kind of blindside us, something that we weren't necessarily thinking about or something that we thought was far off into the future, but then all of a sudden uh, shows up. So it's, it's something to be concerned about when you're thinking just about risk management. 